Hello, and welcome to Raising the Bar with the MBBA. I'm Adiola Adejobi. And I'm Jason Clark, president of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. The MBBA is the largest association of predominantly African-American attorneys in New York. The goal of Raising the Bar with the MBBA is to identify justice issues affecting our communities while also trying to identify solutions in the process. Today, we are going to talk about what to do if you're driving and you're stopped by the police. Joining us are attorneys Mr. Philip Hamilton and co-chair of the MBBA's criminal law section, Ms. Lenora Easter. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank Great. you for having us. Welcome, Lenora. Welcome, Phil. So, uh, you know, we had done a Know Your Rights uh, program earlier on, and I know, Phil, you were with us for that one. Right. And we spent a lot of time talking about uh, encounters if, for example, you have a, um, a situation with a police officer and you're walking down the street. Um, but there was so much there that we actually didn't have a chance to even get into car stops. And that's what I think we really want to focus on today. And it could get a little murky about when you can do what have you when it comes to car stops. So let's just start there. You know, you're driving your car, uh, you see the uh, sirens on, you're told to pull over. You know, what's the first thing you should do if you're um, asked to pull over in your car by a police officer? Okay, Lenore. so yeah. you see those lights, and of course it can be a little scary. Mm -hmm. You want to pull over. Um, you pull over, you want to um, roll down your window, and you want to keep your hands on the steering wheel. You don't want to make any type of movements, you don't want to do anything that's going to give the officer any reason to think that you're doing anything suspicious or an acting in any illegal type of way. When the officer approaches your vehicle and asks you for your license, your registration, and your insurance, you want to comply and you want to give it to him, but you want to let him know, I need to move to my glove compartment or to my purse to get these items, is it okay? Right, alert to every move. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, once he gives you the okay to do so, then you reach for those things and you give it to the officer. The most important thing is compliance. And so what exactly allows the police to pull someone over? The police need reasonable suspicion to believe that the driver has committed a crime, is in the process of committing a crime, is about to commit a crime, as number one. And then number two, to the extent that the officer is just driving behind you and sees you commit um, what he or she believes to be an offense of the vehicle and traffic law, be it you uh, switch lanes and you didn't use your signal, be it they're looking in the car and they can see that your seatbelt's not on, be it you're using your cell phone. Any of those violations can trigger probable cause to believe that you've committed a crime with respect to the vehicle and traffic law, and then at that point they can pull you over. Yeah, let's go into a couple of those details. So, Lenora, you're saying uh, you comply, you pull over. Uh, let's say you have the radio on. Do you, um, what do you do with the radio? Or let's say you have, uh, it's night time. Uh, you know, what are some of the things you may want to do in those circumstances? Well, I mean, if your radio is on and it's loud, again, if the officer tells you to turn it down or you feel maybe you can't hear the officer and you need to, ask the officer, is it okay if I turn down my radio? Um, you would want to do that. If it's dark, um, you're just going to sit there. The officers at night usually will have a flashlight and they'll probably more than likely come up to the window with the flashlight, you know, peeking around inside the car to look at you. Um, and they may ask you out of your car at that point in time. And again, the bottom line is compliance. You should step out of your car. You know, and the reason I think Lenora keeps hitting that point of compliance, and I'm going to hit it, and it's going to be redundant in the course of the show, is because with respect to car stops in particular, they tend to be the most dangerous um, encounter for a lot of police officers, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Especially when we're talking about at nighttime or whenever. It's just a situation that when they're walking to the car, they're generally kind of already in a nerve-wracking mindset because they know that statistically when things do happen to officers in terms of harm or anything along those lines, they tend to be with the car stops. So the reason why it's important to comply, the reason why it's important to say, Officer, may I turn the radio down? Officer, may I go into the glove compartment to get the insurance? Is because you are taking each and every step to assure that officer that everything's going to be okay. You, in effect, are lessening that officer's anxiety, which is putting you in a better position to not get hurt yourself or to not get arrested or, you know, things along those lines. Yeah, that's correct. So we're saying that uh, when we're talking about a car stop, uh, there's at least some thought that the officer may be in a more likely um, you know, position to be injured or being, you know, hurt in some type of way. So there's an extra level of, uh, of care that needs to be taken. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, basically. I mean, you know, just as much as you're nervous, that officer is nervous too. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you want to make sure at the end of the day that you get home safely 
and that you get through the encounter as quickly as possible. So it's important that you comply with the officer, do what the officer says, but you also don't make any type of what we call in the legal world furtive movements, which is basically just making any type of movements that would seem to the officer that you are putting his life in, in danger. Okay, and so um, one of the questions that we received from our audience was, if the police stop you and they don't tell you why they stopped you, do you have the right to know? Technically, you have the right to ask, okay? Does the officer at that point have to tell you and if he or she doesn't, then they face legal consequences later? Not necessarily. So I think it's very critical to kind of put everybody on notice that at that moment, it's not necessarily your right to know why you're being pulled over. The officer can provide you, you know, a courtesy response, right? But to the extent that they don't, the concern that we always have is being in a position where, and we've already kind of outlined the officer's mindset within uh, the kind of car stop scenario, you just don't want to be in a situation where you're doing things that start escalating the situation, right? Mm -hmm. yes. You're demanding to know why you're being pulled over. You're demanding to know all of this information. Whether it's in a demanding tone or even if it's just in a nice tone, to the extent that they at that point don't want to answer, we can, and when I say we, the attorneys, right, yes. as we move forward in any litigation that may ensue after the stop, we can figure that out later. It's not necessarily your job or in your best interest at that point to be litigating it while you're in the car and demanding why you're being pulled over and, and, and everything along those lines. Mm -hmm. So that's actually an important point that I want to uh, make sure we highlight because as many of us know, there was a, um, uh, there is the Right to Know Act, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, when people think of the Right to Know Act, the idea that people have to tell you, you know, why they're stopping you when you're, when you're uh, you know, let's say walking down the street or what have you. Right. So just to be clear for everyone, so does that apply or does that not apply when we're talking about car stops? You should generally presume that it doesn't apply because whenever, in, I think on the last episode we discussed in mm -hmm. a, a small part kind of the Right to Know Act, but the issue is generally when they have to provide you with that information as to why you're being stopped, it's generally dealing with a lower level of suspicion. And we're not gonna like break down like the law but if you remember I said, in order for the police to pull you over, there has to be reasonable suspicion that you've either committed a crime, are committing a crime, about to commit a crime. Once you're at that level, they don't really have to tell you why you're being pulled over. So this kind of distinguishes a car stop as opposed to just a stop when you're walking down the street and the officer's like, hey, come over here, let me talk to you. It's different. Mm -hmm. And presume as much. Okay. Another question that we get sometimes has to do and I feel like I even know some of the answers because I feel like your answer may start with the C. Uh, but, you know, let's say you're being pulled over by a police officer and, you know, you don't want to answer or you don't want to say uh, something. I know that there are certain instances where if you're, again, if you're walking down the street and you don't want to say something to a police officer, that's, that's permitted. Um, is that the same when it comes to car stops or, or are you going to hear that C word? You're going to hear that C word. Right. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, it's your choice if you, just, if you decide you don't want to answer the officer. You're going to make the situation and the encounter more difficult for yourself in the end. And so, I mean, you are supposed to give your license registration and an insurance when an officer asks you when you're driving a car. That's one of the duties or, you know, responsibilities that you have right. as a licensed driver. Right. You have, yes. to, that's, that's, you so have to provide that. Right. So by not doing that, you are in essence breaking the law. So if you want this encounter to be as smooth as possible, maybe just get a warning, get a ticket, go home, answer the officer, give him the documents that he's asking for, comply. And remember, um, you know, and it's key for this discussion, comply is always distinct from consent. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, comply when we're talking about, say you're pulled over, the officer asks you to step out of the car. Okay. Um, comply. Step out of the car. To be clear, um, because I know this sometimes this comes up in questioning, if they ask me to step out of the car, do I have to? Even if I've done nothing wrong, even if I've committed no crimes. Um, the general answer is yes, you have to step out of your car. The Supreme mm -hmm. Court has made that clear since about 1977 that in the context of car stops, if an officer has any reasonable articulation of fear for his or her safety, they can ask you to step out of the car and you have to do so. You not doing so can start a back and forth which can escalate the situation, which can again put you in harm's way uh, via the officer or put you in jail. Step out of the car when you're asked to get out of the car. That being said, to the extent that the officer starts asking you, well, look, can I search your car? Can I search your body? Can I search your purse? The stuff within there. This is where I talk about comply being different and distinct from consent. 
don't consent to those searches of your body, of your things, of your car, because the officer may not actually have a right to search your car. There was a, a, a Jay-Z song from the Black Album, <laughs> 99 Problems, right? right. And, and Jay-Z kind of put out there in a lyric something that has stood with a lot of people over the years to the extent that like the police are always gonna need a warrant to search your car. Not necessarily. There are times when they may not, there are times where they may. It's gonna be difficult for lawyers and most specifically just lay people in the moment to determine is this the time when they need a warrant or not. Instead of like trying to figure all that out, when they're asking you to search your body and all of that stuff, just don't consent. Because if it is a, a situation where they need a warrant and they go ahead and search your car anyway, we as lawyers later can litigate that and if they find something in your car that you didn't want them to find, maybe some marijuana, maybe whatever it else may be that God. shouldn't be in the car, God. Yeah. whatever it may be, at least we can be in a position where we can litigate that, try to keep that stuff out if you didn't get permission. But once you consent and give permission, it's, it's free over. reign, it's over. Yeah. Okay, and so let's say um, someone consented to, by accident or, or not, to having their trunk searched. Does the police then also have a right to search the personal items? So let's say there's a suitcase or, or is a bag. So as opposed to just opening the trunk and seeing what's in there, actually going through things. Do they have the right to do that? Um, yes, they do. You've given them consent. Consent is very powerful. Um, you know, uh, without consent, things are limited as to what, where officers can search and what they can search, what containers or stuff they can search for. When you consent to allowing the officer to search the trunk, you are allowing that officer to search the trunk and the contents therein. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Okay, and so where does reasonable suspicion fall into, um, let's say, before someone's trunk is searched? So they stop the person, mm -hmm. license registration, all that stuff. What would the next steps kind of be after that? So reasonable suspicion comes into place when the officer first, you know, stops the car for a, maybe a traffic violation, reasonable suspicion that they've committed some sort of traffic violation. When the officer approaches the car, probable cause be can become because maybe when the officer searched the car, he smelled marijuana. Maybe in flashing that fla flashlight, he saw a gun in the car. Now you have escalated, now the, the situation has escalated to probable cause where now the officer can then ask the people in the car to step out and it gives some probable cause to search the vehicle. Okay. But to be clear, even before probable cause, because I just want to reiterate this point, they can ask you to step out of the yes. car. So right, even if they didn't see anything troublesome or wrong, if they ask you to step out of the car, Do redundantly, it. get out of the car, okay? Don't fight with the officer in that moment. Um, but I mean, yeah, you hit on some great points because once the officer approaches the car and if they smell burnt marijuana in particular, okay, the smell of burnt marijuana generally will give the officer the right to search the entire car. Yes. Whether it's burnt marijuana or fresh marijuana, whatever it may be, that generally is a free-for-all for the officers just to search every square inch of that car, every nook, mm -hmm. cranny, crevice, they can search it. When you're talking about any other illicit item that you may or may not have in your car, that's when it starts to kind of get into like these legal technicalities as to whether or not they can only search that portion, be it under the front seat, mm -hmm. in the back seat, can they only search the trunk. We will only figure that out once we're in a court of law and can kind of look at the case law and determine where they could search. Right. That's why it's important in that moment for, you know, you as someone who doesn't want your car searched or who doesn't want whatever's in your car to be used against you at a trial, don't consent to the search. So when you say don't consent, because I want to make sure people know, you know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. I mean, is an officer going to say, um, do you consent to uh, having the, you know, open the, the, the glove compartment box? Or are they going to say something like, or, 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 or what language will they use? So people know exactly when they should say no to something. Do you mind if I take a look in your car? If I look in your car, am I going to find anything that shouldn't be there? Anything along those lines where like, they're basically asking your permission, mm -hmm. you know, I can't speak for the exact language sure. that you'll hear, but if it's right. coming across that they're kind of asking me in some way to like figure out what's in my car, you know, you have a couple of options at that point. Um, the main one is do not say yes, okay? Start with that, don't say yes. But I know for some people it's uncomfortable to tell an officer, no, let's just be frank, right? right. Um, because maybe it makes me look guilty even if I wasn't doing anything, now me saying no makes me look guilty. The fact of the matter is it's not about like how you look. It's about how we can protect you as a whole within the system. So I'm telling you in that moment, don't give the answer of yes. If you're looking for a more comfortable way to kind of um, 
you know, assert your right to not have to consent, just say something along the lines of, look, my attorney has, even if you don't have one retained, okay, <laughs> I'm telling everyone now, my attorney has told me not to consent to any searches of the car without my attorney being present. Boom. Now the officer's in a position where either they have to find an attorney for you if you cannot afford one, or they have to wait and go and get a warrant for your car. You've put yourself in a position where you're now protected, and even if the officer goes ahead and searches your car after you've said that you want an attorney, that again is a position where later yes. your attorney can come and help you to keep whatever they find in your car out of evidence against you because the police illegally went ahead and searched the car against you not giving consent when they didn't have the right to search it in the first place. Can we talk about um, when there's a car stop and the, so the police officer has already addressed the person that's driving and now they start to address the person that's in the passenger seat. I mean, they're not the ones who are driving, so what are their rights in a situation like that? When a car is stopped and there's a passenger, you can safely assume that both you and the driver are seized at that point in time, you can't leave. Okay, so both people um, are seized. Yes. <laughs> Everybody who is in the car sees. Everybody in the car sees. <laughs> so at that point in time, the passenger, you know, can ask the officer, you know, is it okay if I can, am I free to leave, can I leave? If the officer tells you that you are free to leave, then by all means, exit the car and go your way. Um, if the officer tells you that you are not free to leave, then it is in your best interest to just sit there and wait. Um, there are times where, you know, the officer may stop the car for a violation that the passenger did. Maybe the passenger was not wearing their seatbelt. Mm. So technically, um, and a passenger does not have to give, like, their information, their ID, or the identification information. But if there is a violation with the passenger, then if the officer asks you for your identification, you should comply and you should give it to him. So let's say uh, I'm driving. Um, they can ask for certainly for my uh, for my insurance information, my registration, you know, my driver's license. But let's say there are, there's one or two people who are in the car with me who are undocumented individuals. Do they ha can the officer ask them about their uh, their status, or can they require something from them? Because I feel like you're answering this, but I want to make sure that we you know emphasize this. You know, whether they can or they can't, let's just presume that they do, because that's always the more right. important question. Officers at times do things that they don't have the right to do. So to the extent that you are asked as a passenger to provide that information, we're just being clear today that you don't have to provide it. And you can simply either remain silent, you can simply say, um, you know, my attorney, once again, has you know, in, informed me not to provide the information. In fact, I don't even know if I would go to that point. It's just you don't have, have to provide to do it. it. You don't mm -hmm. have to provide it, period. Mm -hmm. And just remain silent. All right. Now, let's say uh, you're in the car. And I know these are all different uh, hypotheticals. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Hypothetical. Some of the stories Bring them on. Over here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I feel like we're in a law school class again. <laughs> yeah. So, Socratic you know, method. Exactly. So we're in the car. Uh, you know, Adiola's driving, doing a great job. I'm driving and very well, by my Yes. Okay. <laughs> and I'm in the back seat, and, uh, you know, she's listening to everything that the uh, officer is saying. But, you know, I'm just saying, you know, I had it, man. And I'm talking back, and I'm doing things that actually escalate the, the situation. So the first question I have, is there anything that me as the non-driver can do that can then make it okay for the officer to search the vehicle? Or is it just what the office or just what the driver is doing that matters into, you know, getting over that threshold of no longer needing consent but being now now because I'm acting a fool in the back, you uh, you can now search Adiola's trunk or something like that. So just because you're acting a fool mm -hmm. doesn't Which is often. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't give the officer the right to search the vehicle. Okay. I mean, now the officer may turn his attention to you as the passenger because you are acting out. Mm -hmm. He may then ask for your identification. He, he may start asking you questions. But at that point in time, it doesn't give him the right to then search the vehicle. Again, at the end of the day, if he starts saying, well, you know, I want to search the vehicle, or he asks questions to that level, you, as the driver, can say, no, I, I don't consent to searching the vehicle. This is why it's important, Adiola, as the driver, to <laughs> always know who mm -hmm. you're letting in your car. Yes, very <laughs> important. <laughs> right, 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 right. Be careful <laughs> about clearly car. letting Jason in your car. <laughs> yes. And then more importantly, like just for everyone, kind of know, look, generally when, they, when we have people in our cars to the extent that we're not Uber drivers, we know the person. Mm -hmm. So if you know that person is the type of person to carry weed on them, to carry guns on them, to carry other illicit types of objects on them, maybe don't let them into your car. Because to the extent that they are in the back seat or they're in the front seat, like with these illicit objects, 
um, yeah, you are putting yourself in a position where you could be arrested for possessing you could be arrested for possessing the gun that you brought in in the back seat, mm -hmm. which is why you're acting a fool trying to get the officer to not come back there and <laughs> find right. it. But right. like, it could implicate the both of you. Both of right. you could be arrested. And I've had situations, Adiola, where basically the driver is coming in like, it wasn't my ex, whatever right. it is. It right. wasn't my illicit object. It was his or it was hers. Why was I arrested? Right. Well, because he didn't want to assume responsibility for it. So now everybody in the car can be arrested for it. And then at that point, yes, the car can be searched. So the everybody, trunk. not right. just the driver. Correct. Everybody. everybody. Correct. Yes. So know who you're letting in your car, what they have on them before you're letting them in your car. Because, you know, these are situations and decisions that could ultimately get you arrested when you did nothing wrong. You were driving fine, as you said. Right, you know? right. And Jason, if you were just acting a fool, it's one thing. But if you have weed and a gun on you, you don't want to draw attention to yourself. Yeah. You definitely don't. Right. <laughs> nice. Right. Um, so I want to talk about, obviously, in this digital age, everyone's mm. recording cell phones. That just because sometimes what's written and what happens lines up or doesn't line up. Mm -hmm. So if you're stopped by the police, do you have a right to pull out your phone and start recording? You can. Um, there's no law to say that you can't pull out your phone and start recording, but is it safe to do so is the question. Um, if you're in the middle of an investigation, whether it's for a traffic infraction or it's for a possible crime that the officer is saying is being committed, I don't think that common sense or judgment would say, would say that it's the best thing to do to pull out your phone at that point in time and start recording. I believe that that, in my opinion, would escalate the situation further and it can make the situation worse than what it actually would have been. And, and, and you know, I, I love the point that you made and I think we touched on this on the last episode, we're gonna touch on this now. Again, sometimes it's not so much about like what your right is, it's about what is the common sense decision at that moment that will again allow that police encounter to swiftly, quickly, and safely go by and allow you to come out on the other side alive, allow you to come out on the other side not in jail, and allow you to come out on the other side to the extent if the officer did something wrong, we can handle it later. You know, there's always redress in the civil courts or whatever may be the situation if we have to go and challenge the you know, police on something they did wrong. We can do it later, but you have to make it out of the situation. So I don't necessarily think that when the officer's coming up to the window, for you to be taking your iPhone, shoving it in his face, yelling, I'm recording you, I'm recording you, is that really the best decision to make when we've already explained that officers in car steps are already a little bit nervous, right? And like already kind of in a position where they're high anxiety. I just don't think it's the right thing to do. If you can find a way to maybe turn the phone on put it in the cup holder, right, right. and just kind of have it recording right. either audio mm -hmm. or having a recording video, fine, but even be careful with that because when the officers pull you over, the last thing you want to be doing is like kind of pulling the phone out of your pocket and like they're looking in the window seeing that you, looks like you just grabbed something and then you're escalating the situation that way because they think that you've reached for a gun or something right. like that. It's sometimes just not worth it. So let me ask you something. If, if someone stopped, um, the police is not the window, can they say, I would like to record this conversation before we get started. Yes, I they would can, like to. They, okay. they, they definitely can say that. Um, and depending on what the officer's response, if the officer's response is that's fine, then by all means go ahead and do so. You know, if you can tell that the officer is getting agitated or upset about that, then, you know, like Phil said, you know, if you can kind of conspicuously put it to the side and have it on um, record audio, then do that. But if not, put it down and just follow the instructions of the officer. Right. Okay. So another issue, uh, you know, in the last few minutes, we're already running through. I we'll have to have a third know your rights. <laughs> exactly. Fourth know your rights. Um, but about de-escalation. So let's say uh, Adiola and I are in the car. We're both doing the right thing. You know, we, we're doing everything that you guys told us today. And so you're for, not acting the fool? I am time? not acting a fool. Okay. You know, okay. So this is a, a fictitious uh, story. Um, <laughs> But for whatever reason, it still seems like the, uh, the encounter is escalating. You know, what are some things that you can do to be able to de-escalate this um, the situation? And on top of that, I know we kind of touched on a little bit, but I also want to make sure that at the end we also discuss a little bit about what your remedies are outside of this. Because I don't think, I don't want, certainly don't want anyone thinking that, you know, people can just do whatever they want to you and there's right. nothing out there. No so, consequences. Right? Yeah, so how can you de-escalate and what are, what, remedies are available to you after the encounter is over? 
De-escalating, I think, plays back into like that C word of compliance. Comply, right? To the extent, so if you see that like a verbal interaction like with an officer is taking it to a place that there's an escalation, de-escalation at that point is just being quiet and just like allowing the officer to gain some sort of control over the situation. You have to let the officer feel as though they have control. Generally, once they have the control, you'll have the de-escalation that you're looking for. But when they believe that the situation is starting to get out of control, they're gonna continue to escalate to make sure that they have it, especially in the context of a car stop. Okay. Yeah, and so um, we only have a few minutes remaining, but I do want to ask this question um, from one of our viewers, which relates to um, these rules, you know, do they apply uh, to white citizens in the same way that they apply to black and brown communities? They apply to every United States citizen. Um, you know, in reality, do, does it play out differently for blacks and Latinos than it does for whites? Of course. But at the end of the day, the rights are the rights of a U.S. citizen, whether you're black, white, Latino, whatever. Um, and like I said, we basically want to make sure that we comply with them, whether you're black, white, Latino, because it doesn't matter sometimes the color of your skin. The situation, if it escalates to a point where now you're putting yourself in danger, that's not going to be good. So we're here to make sure that you don't do that and you comply and you get home safely and then you let us handle the recourse through the courts. Okay, so for the next question, I would like to ask about breathalyzers. Do people have the right to refuse taking a breathalyzer test? Yes, a person has a right to refuse a breathalyzer test, but there is a consequence to doing so. When you obtain your license, you are basically stating that you are going to adhere to the rights of the road, which includes that if an officer asks you to take a breathalyzer test, that you will take one. However, you do have a right to refuse. If you do so, understand that your license will be suspended for one year. When you go through the court system, you are you and your attorney are allowed to go to the DMV to have what's called a refusal hearing, where you will try to contest that the refusal was not only voluntarily done. And if you win, you get to get your license back. But if you don't, understand that your license will be suspended for one year period of time. Right. Don't drink and drive. Right. 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 And then uh, just very quickly, Phil, you had mentioned the fact that if you can smell marijuana, that that gives the officer license to essentially search the entire vehicle. Now, we don't, it hasn't happened yet, but let's say marijuana does become legal, you know, under New York state law. Uh, you know, what do you think those implications are for car stops and things such as this? I think uh, a lot of police officers and state troopers that like are all looking for an easy reason to be able to search a car will be very upset. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why you see like a lot of kind of like their fraternal organizations pushing back against like the legalization concept, mainly because it's just such a big investigative tool. I don't think that they look at marijuana the way that, you know, they did like in Reefer Madness or that it's like mm -hmm. technically needing to be some you know, schedule one crazy illegal drug. It's just more, it's a great investigative tool. If you as an officer can articulate that you smell marijuana in a car, boom, now you can search the entire car. I mean, but here's the other thing though. If they do smell burnt marijuana in the car, that could still potentially be probable cause to believe that you're driving while ability impaired right. on drugs, right? Mm -hmm. So they could still potentially go that route. So that actually may make sense because it, even if it becomes legal, it may not be legal to be, you know, using marijuana while you're driving. Right, and then yeah. could they still go and search the car to find the marijuana the way that maybe they would with a drunk driver they're going to find like a mm. beer bottle or something so okay well that was great um unfortunately we are out of time but i want to thank our guests for joining us today thank you for watching raising the bar on the manhattan neighborhood network